okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight on the very first Shores of South Devon um, um, Zoom talk. Uh, our guest speaker tonight is uh, the renowned, I would say, Keith Hiscox. Um, it's very fitting Keith is doing our very first Zoom talk tonight because he was going to be our very first guest speaker uh, in our planned physical talks we had uh, planned for back in um, beginning the year, just prior to lockdown. And we got within a week of um, Keith joining us for a talk at Timworth Yacht Club. And then, of course, it all stopped. So it is very fitting that Keith is here tonight. Uh, for, for you, some of you that don't know Keith, uh, he essentially he is a, a, a renowned marine biologist, conservationist, diver, and a fantastic photographer. Um, although Keith is now officially retired, um, he's still a very big presence at the Marine Biological Association. Uh, but I used to see him quite often. And he is well known in Plymouth diving circles, where I think he is still quite active. So without too much ado, we can uh, shoot over to Keith. But before we do that, I'm just going to do a quick plug for his book. Uh, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It is a work of art, I would say. And I think Keith might plug it again at the end of his talk. So that's the book. So, OK, um, over to Keith. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Mike, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, quite a few of you I know, um, some I don't, so uh, hopefully I'll bump into you on a seashore somewhere in South Devon at some time. Um, but of course, what I'm going to be talking about is um, beyond the shore, below the tides. Um, I'm not going to encourage you all to take up diving, but also I'm not going to assume that I'm going to be able to give you a comprehensive idea of what you're likely to see down there. But all the time, I'll try and wrap up my slides with a little bit of information about the biology of the species, what's special about them, what's unusual about them, um, and perhaps a little bit about how things are, are changing in our seas. So with that said, I'll start to share my screen. And get that going. He says, hopefully. That's it. There we are. So my talk is about a natural history of seabed habitats off South Devon. Um, I'm an associate fellow at the Marine Biological Association, which essentially means I'm retired, but they still find me useful. Um, unfortunately, with all the restrictions and with trying just to keep the lab open to a reasonably small number of people, um, people who are not employees um, are banned. So I've been in the lab once since March. Uh, so this is a picture uh, taken right in the middle of Wembury Bay. So if you stand on the beach at Wembury and look out to sea, um, this is the sort of scene that you'll see on the rocks. And I hope that all of your gardens looked as fabulous as this uh, during the summer. Um, lots of different marine species. You can see the, uh, the pink sea ferns. You can see the yellow branching sponges, the Ross coral. It's called coral, but it's not really. It's a, a sea mat. You see the black sea cucumbers, the white dead men's fingers, um, a really rich variety of, of species at about 24, 25 meters below sea level. So not many seaweeds at all. It's almost all animals because of course, because of the turbidity of the water, uh, the light uh, only penetrates to a certain depth. Um, by the time you get below about 28, 30 meters, there just isn't enough light for um, the folio seaweeds to grow and so everything that you see is animals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you from <coughs> east to west along the, the South Devon coast and we'll start with beer with this rather nice um, uh, painting, uh, George Marks. I think some of you were on the shore at beer uh, this last weekend of, of good spring tides. Um, but I've started at beer uh, and I'm going to start with saying a little bit of context, if you like, a bit of whimsical stuff. Because way back in the middle of the 19th century, uh, naturalists were very, very busy exploring our shores, documenting what they saw, uh, giving 
species, new species to science, names and so on. And one of the nicest books that there is, is the book uh, by um, the Reverend Charles Kingsley called Glaucus or the Wonders of the Shore. Of course, Glaucus was a mythical Greek who on eating a certain herb was able to go beneath the surface of the sea. Not sure what that herb was, but um, he was able to, uh, to do that. And Charles Kingsley uh, went on the shore, but he also went dredging. And I think he, what he had to say in his book reflects very much what a lot of frustrated marine naturalists must have felt in the middle of the 19th century. Perhaps what some of you might feel. Uh, in his book, he writes, the riches of which, in other words, the dredging, uh, have to be seen rather by the imagination than by the eye. For such spoonfuls of the treasure as the dredge brings up to us come too often rolled and battered, torn from their sights, contracted by fear, mere hints of what the populous reality below is like. And often, standing on the shore at low water, one has longed to walk on and in under the waves and see it all for a moment. So I hope that during this presentation, I'm at least going to give you a little opportunity to, to see it all for a moment um, in the way that Charles Kingsley would have liked to have seen it. So obviously this is the length of coast that I'm covering um, from Beer around to Plymouth. Um, you know where Beer is, but here it is just in case. And, and this is the sort of thing that someone like me looks at and says, well, where's a good place to go diving? Because when we were undertaking a program called the Marine Nature Conservation Review of Great Britain, which went from 1987 to 1998, um, we did shore surveys and we dived all around England, Scotland and Wales. Um, this was a major project commissioned by the Nature Conservancy Council and uh, I, I led the program and you know, we got to see all around Britain and develop things like the classification of marine habitats, the biotopes classification. So a lot of very good things came from that, very much of its time survey. You won't find people doing that sort of thing from the statutory nature conservation bodies now, unless it's monitoring condition in protected areas. So Beer Roads, we look at a chart like this and we try and work out where the representative locations might be, um, where the places worthwhile might be. Looks like a fairly level seabed until we get to this 20 meter contour. So we might have chosen a site here or a site round back here where there's rising ground and a site inshore where there'd be seaweeds and not just animals. So that's a Nabralty chart and we've always had access to that sort of information. Uh, I'm going to talk about two locations, Beer Head Circular Reef and Beer Fans, which is really Beer Sea Fans. Uh, 16 meters below chart datum and about 20 meters below chart datum. But now we've got this sort of facility. We don't just need a chart, we can actually use sonar surveys, uh, acoustic surveys, which give us a topographical map of the, uh, the seabed. So you can see all of the initial rocky reefs, there's rock here, and then we've got this peculiar feature here, Beerhead Circular Reef. That looks like a good target. And we, we discover that um, the same sort of features occur on the land on Beer Head, uh, eroded to leave a bump as the highest spot and the concentric ridges, I'm guessing, are successively lower ledges. So let's have a look at that. That's a good target. And we're out there with Sea Search. Sea Search is a citizen science project. Um, volunteers uh, who quite often get funding from the Statue and Nature Conservation Agencies, <coughs> work especially through the wildlife trusts. Um, and here we are on Blue Turtle out of Lyme Regis, just coming into Beer Bay. And those divers are gonna be a whole mix of people who couldn't tell a sea fan from a sea fur, and who are very good at acting as dive buddies or just uh, recording what sort of habitats are present on the seabed through to people who know most of the conspicuous species and can fill out quite complicated forms, uh, right through to professional marine biologists who find that by going out at weekends in their own time, um, they can actually get in the water and overcome the rather 
uh, over the top health and safety regulations which exist for people undertaking diving as a part of their work. So here we are, we're going to jump in the water and we're going to explore those two features. And you can just see these sorts of ridges. So um, that sort of raised area, uh, little drops, little short drops, about sort of 20 centimetres, eight inches. Um, plenty of crevices underneath where we'll dwell crabs and various things like these um, sea uh, the peacock worms. Um, I don't know what is being looked at here. But you've got a branching sponge, you've got gelatinous uh, sea mats, you've got branching sea mats, uh, you've got dead men's fingers, uh, you've got a, a gold cine wrasse here, um, but no seaweeds, quite a lot of sediment on the rock here. So sediment on the rock does attract some unusual species actually, um, which I'll come to in a minute, but uh, a bit dull looking, but nevertheless it's another site to uh, survey and, and characterise. And these are the sorts of species which you'll see there. Um, so you've got an unusual sponge. Um, the sponge, I often hind when I, sorry, a lot of these haven't got common names, um, actually preferentially settles on seaweeds and those seaweed fronds are coated by sponge. Now I don't see that in the Plymouth area. I see it much further east. Uh, sea fans all along the South Devon coast Pink sea fans also in white. You can see a small white one here. And the interesting thing is that along the South Devon coast, I would say about 0.1% of the pink sea fans are in fact white. When you get to Brittany, about 20% of them are white. When you get to Gibraltar, 100% of them are white and it's the same species. Why they're white or pink, I don't know. Spiny lobsters, uh, charismatic species uh, which disappeared for 40 years due to overfishing until 2014 when we suddenly started to see babies uh, and here uh, two years ago is one uh, just walking about on the seabed out foraging uh, keeping its antennae ready to um, whip and slash at any potential predators that's what those antennae do they'll whip and slash to keep other crustaceans or anything that's trying to eat them away I'm going to go on to this one and you think, well, what on earth is he showing us up for? It's just, just a load of sandy gravel um, with a few scruffy bits of something or other on the top. Well, this mollusk, Rosalaria dubii, you can see the two siphons here in the close-up. That close-up is smaller than your little fingernail, but it's a species which we don't see in the Plymouth area. In fact, you'll see it in places like Tor Bay, and then once you get west of Tor Bay, no, I don't recall ever seeing it, but it lives burrowing into the limestone rock. So it actually uh, can live in the rock. So that's a species which is more of an East uh, South Devon species. And the next one is as well. So these Neptune heart um, sea squirts, uh, some are as big as your fist, as your clenched fist. Uh, but the interesting thing about these was that they used to occur all along the coast of South Devon. Um, Lots of them recorded in Plymouth Sound and on the open coast out of Plymouth. But after the 1982-83 winter, um, you couldn't find them west of Tor Bay. Uh, sorry, west of Sulcombe. So west of so Sulcombe, there's a large population. If you go out on the shore at Sulcombe, uh, low water, you'll find plenty of these Neptune heart sea squirts. Um, the furthest west I've seen them is off Bulk Tail on a wreck, just one of them. So why haven't they come back to uh, the coast near Plymouth and so on? Probably because the larvae are very, very short lived, probably only a couple of hours before they settle. So once they've been annihilated, it's going to take a long time for them to, to come back. And then I said there were some particular species which lived on sand covered rock. They're things like um, this um, sponge, Sciocalypta, which has these pencil like protuberances and then they stick up from a large fleshy mass underneath the gravel. Um, Ross, that uh, bryozoan which is called a Ross coral, uh, various again these um, erect branching sea mats. So really this is quite characteristic of the eastern part of the, the South Devon coast. Let's go a bit further west now, let's go to Tor Bay. 
I'm not sure whether I put a map on here, probably not. Let's go to Babacan Beach. And Babacan Beach is a very popular shore diving site. Um, it's sheltered from the prevailing winds. Quite often visibility is very good. It is very shallow, but there is lots of very interesting marine life um, on the rocky reefs, the overhangs, um, and so on. So there we are, um, Tor Bay, Babacan, um, strong southwesterly winds, it's sheltered. And that's the highlight. And I see Pete Messenger's in the uh, audience and, and that's Pete um, about three or four years ago. Uh, and the highlight of the year is at the end of April and through into May when the cuttlefish come in to breed. So you've got a female cuttlefish here being stalked by a male cuttlefish. And quite often there's another male cuttlefish as well sort of apprentice who's going to be hovering here. Uh, so Pete's doing some video, I'm taking still pictures um, and very much targeted to get those pictures for uh, the book um, which was mentioned at the beginning. So that's a real highlight for divers to go there but there are other species as well which are unusual and I haven't put a picture in but are things like the anemone shrimps which occur here. Uh, there are now uh, variable blennies, which uh, appeared in British waters for the first time in about uh, 2014. They're a southern species. And, and so there's lots of things at Babacum and in Tor Bay, uh, which are very interesting for a marine biologist. And one of the most interesting features in Babacum, although it hasn't happened this year, is these molting aggregations of spiny spider crabs. Now, some of you might know this is Maya squinado, I'm afraid the taxonomists work overtime to change the names. Uh, they're very careful about making sure that the right people are given um, the authority, the, the precedence, um, the naming. But hundreds and hundreds of these spiny spider crabs, which are normally very widely dispersed, come and make these mounds, which people incorrectly um, describe as mating uh, aggregations. No, they're not mating, they molt, and then they disperse, they go into deeper water, and when the shells have hardened, they'll melt, they're, they'll mate. So this is a uh, molting aggregation, and you are now in a position to put people um, right who say that it's a breeding aggregation. So that's the sort of fantastic thing that occasionally we come across. Um, I was actually taken there, I was guided there by Terry Griffiths, who dives a lot um, out of Babacombe, and he was kind enough to take me on a little guided tour. Although I must say that he had difficulty finding them because the mounds sort of move around. They're not always in the same place. Um, this, this year, they haven't occurred at Babacombe, they've occurred at Ladybird Cove at Brixham. So um, not consistent. And also for the first time, um, we've seen these sorts of mounds at Lundy and Mags Ashton, who is in the audience, can correct me about this being the first year after the presentation, but um, exactly the same sort of appearance off the jetty at Lundy. And it is a place, Babacombe is a place where you never know, you might find a seahorse. Now, seahorses are a protected species. You need a license if you can go and deliberately look for them. Um, and on this one, I was photographing cuttlefish eggs and I thought, oh, there's a seahorse there. And I spent the next half hour just kneeling on the seabed, watching it but bimbling about in amongst the um, sea oak in the background there, um, obviously picking away at small crustaceans attached to the seaweed. Um, and when it came out into the open, I'd take a picture, usually with natural light. Um, there was some controversy at the time about flash guns disturbing the seahorses, but a very good study undertaken um, in Australia just shows that the seahorses don't give a damn about uh, being flashed at. Um, but I think if you're in an aquarium situation, a public aquarium situation where people were continuing, continually taking flash pictures of them, they probably would get disturbed. So this is a picture taken with, with natural light. But yes, this is the only seahorse that I have ever seen in British waters in 50 years of diving. Uh, but there are some excellent video taken by Andy Jackson. Uh, this is a pair of seahorses. Of course, as you well know, 
it's the male that becomes pregnant. So the female uh, produces the eggs and then shoots the eggs into uh, the male's breeding pouch and he fertilizes them somehow. There's no definitive uh, explanation of how they're fertilized, but presumably they're fertilized inside the pouch. They grow up inside the pouch and it's the males which releases, uh, which release the babies. Now I haven't seen this, uh, I've, got, I've got the video, I've got an hour, half an hour's worth of Andy Jackson's video. Um, and there's about sort of two minutes of really usable video in it, uh, but it's absolutely fascinating. It shows them doing their courtship dance and, uh, and so on. Sadly, Andy Jackson died uh, a couple of months after he did this video work. And I think that everything's got very confused since then but I do hope that the um, video will turn up on the TV screen sometime. Okay, we've moved a little bit further um, uh, to the west and we've got into the River Dart. Uh, the River Dart isn't a fantastic place for diving, um, but again, Sea Search had some gaps to fill and we particularly wanted to look at the uh, jetty piles in the marina and to look for non-native species. Um, so you've got Charlotte Bolton, who now runs Sea Search. You've got Chris Wood, who used to run Sea Search and still takes part. Um, uh, you've got John Bishop from the Marine Biological Association, who's gonna be especially looking at the non-native species. So lots of permissions required, but um, well worthwhile. There you are, if you're not sure where Dartmouth is, it's there. And, and I was really fascinated by the growths on the jetty piles. So there are lots of man-made structures, whether they're jetty piles or whether they're wrecks or other structures, which attract a very specific um, collection of species. So this is typical of rias, in other words, flooded river valleys, and typical of artificial substrata. Um, you've got plumos and anemones here, you've got mermaid's glove, sponges, uh, you've got lots of mussels which are here encrusted with a, a sea squirt, uh, you've got encrusting sponges, uh, all sorts of species which are typical both of flooded river valleys, rias, and of artificial substrata, in this case jetty piles. And, and this is, I haven't got the name of the biotope here, but this will be a distinctive biotope in the classification of 350 different level four biotopes on uh, the, uh, in the intertidal and subtidal around Britain. So in terms of being able to give uh, habitats a name, we can do it. And we can do it because of the Marine Nature Conservation Review Surveys between 1987 and 1998. And if we go outside uh, the River Dart on the Dartmouth Mewstone, not the best of dives that I've had. Um, with photography, of course, you're always struggling with stuff in the water, most likely uh, particulate matter here, silt and so on, sometimes plankton. Uh, but of course, the plumos and enemies love it. Um, they're passive suspension feeders. They're waiting for the current to bring them food and then catch it on their feathery tentacles. So they're thriving here. Um, you also get pink sea fans, not in very good condition because the, uh, this is partly wound up with fishing line, but also uh, the cat sharks um, lay their eggs on uh, the sea fans and wrap their tendrils around. So um, the marine life that lives on sea fans is very, very fascinating. And I'll come back to it a little bit later. Um, Circulatural rock, no seaweeds, lots of Devonshire cup corals, which doubtless you find occasionally on the shore, uh, an edible crab and so on. One of the most interesting things, and I still get a really good picture of this, is the crevice fauna. So you get a whole range of species just tucked in, keeping away from predators, things like um, uh, scallop-like clamis, uh, the um, cucumeria, sorry, cucumeria, uh, which are the, uh, I've forgotten the name now, but anyway, um, holothurians, uh, and, and there'll be fish as well in there. One of these days I'll get some really good quick, quick pictures of um, a whole line of different species taking advantage of these crevices to hide away from the unwanted attention of predators. 
Selcombe Harbour, very, very well worthwhile a visit if you're looking at the intertidal. Um, the subtital is much more problematic. We did the survey there in 1986 when it was much less busy and obviously we had permissions to dive and dredge and, and so on there as well as do intertidal work. Um, but when we had permission this year it was because we had uh, bio blitz organised by Jack Sewell and um, we got permission to dive at Scoble Point which I was sure I had a picture of but I couldn't find it. Scoble Point is a sort of pinch as you get halfway up towards the Kingsbridge estuary and uh, it's a place which we surveyed in 1986 and so we went back there to see whether it was much as before um, and I'm not sure whether we had golden kelp but the story with golden kelp is that it's a warm water species at a very good low spring tide you can see it at low water it's got this very clean stipe it seems to have a very good anti-fouling system which keeps it clear of attached algae and it has got a sort of golden flush to it so there in the shallowest water you get golden kelp first found in british waters in 1948 in plymouth sound and very soon afterwards was found in salcombe harbour got other um, unusual southern species of seaweeds like gracilaria multipartita here we are like uh, neptune's heart and uh, also a different uh, ascidian sea squirt, Ascidiella aspersa. Of course, these are solitary sea squirts. They've got one siphon which sucks the water in, the water passes through a filter, and then is passed out through the second siphon. So they're active suspension feeders. They're actually pumping the water. And then the level seabed, um, I hope you can spot the scallop. Here's a scallop. There's a scallop shell. Uh, but dredging has been banned here for some years now and that means that the gravelly shelly seabed is largely undisturbed and, and is very rich but there are non-native species like Crepidula fornicata the slipper limpet I can't actually see them there and I won't bore you to look at them I, I want to make the point that I take photographs but photographs don't tell the whole story so here's the seagrass bed and the seagrass is very, very well developed um, in Salcombe Harbour. Go there on a low spring tide, like a nought metre tide, and you'll see the seagrass beds enormously exposed. Um, and lots of um, unusual species scuttling about uh, in amongst the seagrass. Uh, but a lot of things are below the surface. And Jack Sewell kindly you know, drew this drawing, which was based on the species in Salcombe Harbour. I think optimistically he's put a seahorse in. But of course, things like this Catopterus tube worm, um, this uh, Maya, uh, or it could be, uh, uh, I've got the name of Otter Shell, but lots of things live below the surface. There's scallops, uh, there are hermit crabs with the cloak anemone on the back, um, there are Plisia sea hares. Uh, bass swimming in amongst the um, seagrass, sea anemones attached to seagrass, cuttlefish, and this beast here, which is a fan mussel, a trina fragilis. And at one time, uh, there were about five a trina which could be found in the seagrass beds um, near the Marine Hotel in um, Salcombe Harbour. Uh, but it's very, very unusual to find, and it lives in the sediment it's about 50 centimeters long and just the top pokes above and again it's an active suspension feeder it's, it's pulling water in and then filtering it and, and passing it out so do look out for fan muscles or trinofragilis okay we're going to move further west we're getting into big Bree bay now and so we've gone past that sort of break point of bulk tail and a lot of the things, a lot of the species uh, which we found on the east facing coast, uh, the, the Neptune's hearts, uh, etc., are no longer present. But this is this East Ruts is a particularly interesting location. Again, I hope your garden looked like this by the end of the summer. Um, pink sea fans, uh, yellow sponges, they're called boring sponges because they do bore into the limestone. So they do particularly well where there's limestone rock. Uh, sea firs, 
uh, dolls and eras, um, branching sponges, uh, all sorts of stuff. Now I'll say again, we're not often blessed with very good visibility underwater. I would guess here the visibility is probably about four meters. Uh, I've got a 12 millimeter wide angle lens on my camera uh, and so it does look much better than it really is. Uh, if ever we get 20 meters visibility underwater, well that's an absolute once in a blue moon if once every five years type experience. You're usually working your way in, in fairly misty conditions um, and six meters is very good. 10 meters is fantastic if you get that much visibility. And all the time you're trying to avoid when you're taking pictures backscatter. So there's reflection off these particles in the water, um, which I try to avoid as best I can. So when I come up from a dive at um, this particular location at East Ruts, then divers will say, Keith, Keith, what was all that grass on the seabed? Well, that's what they call the tubularia hydroids. Um, I think actually I meant hydroids tubularia in divisor and also Nematesia antonina. You can see here the sort of limestone bedrock with pock marks, the holes drilled by mollusks and so on. Um, and the view up to nine meters below chart datum. So this is the kelp. There's enough light getting down to nine meters below chart datum, lowest spring tide for the kelp to grow. And then as you go deeper, you get red seaweeds and then you get no folio seaweeds at all. So, you know, that's about right for that South Devon coast out of Plymouth. Kelp goes down to nine metres below chart datum. OK, uh, this is a U-boat view of um, an, an aircraft carrier. And um, we once had some uh, guest divers in our diving club um, and um, they were from Germany. And we showed them the chart with all of our different favourite dive sites on. And uh, they said, you have many wrecks around Plymouth, why is that? And we all went quiet. And then somebody said, U-boats. Um, <laughs> and I think, unfortunately, that the U-boats are responsible for a great many of the wrecks out of Plymouth. So the main of Bolt Tail uh, in 2012, and I put that date on there because the storms that we had in 2013-14 uh, really did a lot of damage to that wreck. Uh, the wrecks aren't going to be there forever, they're going to end up as a pile of plates. Um, but still, a very distinctive biotope, uh, you know, very distinctive and named in the biotope classification as a steel wreck community. So there's a distinctive steel wreck community. Uh, the picture on the right is the steering gear. So the, the chain which turned the rudder goes around this uh, steering quadrant here and the rudder is lying on the seabed somewhere here. So you know you've got distinctive features like this. This will be at about 35 meters depth <coughs> and it's underneath the stern so you ain't got much light. But what is left when the wrecks start to break up are the boilers. So this is the wreck of the Perse here in Big Brew Bay <clears throat> an absolutely favourite diving site. Um, it's changed enormously since I started diving regularly out of Plymouth uh, 20 years ago. Um, a lot of the features such as the prop shaft tunnel have gone, um, but there, there are still some very interesting uh, features to it. It's at about 30 metres. This is the steering quadrant, so you've got one part of where the chain goes round uh, and the matching part is off the screen down here. Um, and the rudder is lying on the seabed nearby, uh, dominated by uh, dead men's fingers, white dead men's fingers. But one of the most interesting things about wrecks is they do often attract unusual species. So the southern cup coral, Caryophilia in ornata, um, that's to be found underneath that steering quadrant and in some structures just off the wreck. The Weymouth carpet coral, uh, that's a picture on the on the boilers. You can see it's got a little cluster of very small coralites. That cluster is no bigger than your thumbnail. Um, I've never found it intertidally. Uh, it's well worthwhile looking for intertidally in North Devon. I'm sure it should be there, uh, but it's uh, something which is well worthwhile finding. Uh, pink sea fingers. Oh, it got the old name there. It used to be called Prithropodium hibernicum. 
it's now Alcyonium hibernicum. So it's got the same generic name as the uh, other seed fingers which we encounter. It's very small again. I mean, that picture area is probably about four inches across, 10 centimeters across. And then just some cheeky chappies, which are not rare at all, they're everywhere. Uh, things like Tom Pop Lenny, which everyone seems to love. And that's in one of the boiler holes. But one of the great things about the Persia is the fantastic forests of sea fans that are there. The sea fans have done really well. And also the enormous shoals of fish, uh, poor cod trisopterus, but also bib pouting. Uh, there's a gold cine here in the foreground. Um, lots of Devonshire cup corals. But yes, the sea fans do seem to like wrecks. And you can occasionally encounter spectacular fish. This is a John Dory um, swimming over the, uh, over the wrecks. And you also uh, wonder whether who's watching who. The conger eel is watching the diver or the diver is watching the conger eel. But congers do like wrecks because there are lots of holes for them to back into and hide into. So again, this is the Persia. But I, I do find wrecks fascinating, but I particularly like to look at um, the reef habitats, the rock reef habitats. Uh, and the coast here, um, what I call the Hillsea coast, uh, basically uh, from the Urm westwards uh, to the Mewstone, including the Mewstone ledges, absolutely fabulous. So again, I hope your garden looked like this by the end of the summer. Lots of pink sea fans, yellow branching sponges, Red sea fingers, Alcyonium glomeratum, um, yellow sponges, uh, lots of fish, uh, some, you know, very spectacular scenery as well. Uh, but also there are lots of caves along this coast and I'm sure you could get into those caves on a really low spring tide and they've got very distinctive biotopes in them. A lot of calcareous sponges, elephant hide sponges and so on. I'd like to do some more exploring in them you need really calm weather, an offshore wind or no wind at all. And uh, I'd like to look more at the specialist species which live in those caves. And then some fabulous places like this. My, my diving colleagues in the diving club laugh at me when I talk about, um, about the um, Stoke Point sponge gardens. Um, now this is part of a biotope which is a Unicella varicosa pink sea fans, Pentapora foliacea, the Ross coral biotope. But look at them, they are ancient. Uh, we actually, when the Nature Conservation Agency spent their money on uh, useful things, uh, we had some marked individuals or individuals we could relocate at Lundy, which we went back to several years running. And there were large individuals and there were small individuals. And we would put um, a checkerboard against the back of them photograph them and check the growth weights. The growth rates, whether they were large or small, were less than a millimetre a year. And these are about 25 centimetres high. So you do the sums. These are very long lived and very slow growing. And they also recruit infrequently. You do not find them attached to the wrecks. So these are species which, although they're not listed on any conventions or statutes um, as needing, needing protection, a species which will not come back if they are lost. And the way that they'll be lost is through mobile fishing gear, which doesn't usually go over reefs like this, but sometimes fishermen will take a chance. But also they get caught in gill nets as well, which are laid over reefs like this. So, you know, they are under threat from human activities. Uh, for some reason that's not going forward. Uh, that's it. So we're going a bit further west again and another harbour where you need special permission to go in the water. And this was during a bio blitz um, in 2017 and three of us getting into the water on the harbour pontoons very early in the morning. Uh, I thought very early in the morning we'll have no trouble at all with ships moving around but they all come in to fuel up first thing in the morning. Um, so we all did have ships around but the harbour master was steaming around in his boat with his you know, sort of code flag A, his diving flag and warning people off and so on. So off we go and the seabed here is no more than two meters below chart datum. So don't expect fabulous stuff 
We were hoping for fabulous stuff because Salcombe Harbour itself is a classic, very rich site. In fact, this is what the level seabed at two metres looks like. Uh, lots of tide swept seaweeds and a, a gravelly bottom. Um, some rock, rock structures, but also old moorings and such like, which turned out to be the most interesting uh, features. And lots and lots and lots of sea hares. So I suspect you get those on the shore in large numbers, but um, Salcombe Harbour. Okay, I've left Salcombe Harbour and I've gone around the corner into, uh, not Salcombe Harbour, I've left um, the Yam, I've left the Yam and I've gone into Bobby Sand Harbour uh, and this fantastic site. This is a male cork queen wrasse servicing his nest. Now you do intertidal, you do rocky shores. I have counted as many as 13 of these nests at Wembury on a low tide, not even a low spring tide, or not even a very good low spring tide. So these nests also occur intertidally and they're made up of soft seaweeds on the inside and crusty seaweeds on the outside. And the male will try to entice females in to lay eggs, which of course he will fertilize. And there's a very long and interesting story about um, males that try to pretend to be females to get in and all that sort of thing. Um, but this is at Bobby Sand Harbour and uh, these beautiful structures, about the size of a small loaf of bread and uh, the male cork queen wrasse, very colourful, doing its stuff. So all sorts of things to see underwater in way of fish behaviour and, and Paul Naylor in particular does a fabulous job of, um, very patient job of watching fish and their behaviour. Um, he does lots of patient stuff, I do lots of rushing around taking lots of pictures stuff. But also in Bobby Sand Harbour, another warm water species, black-faced blenny. Now, this was first discovered in Portland Harbour in, I think, the mid or late 1970s. And it turned up in Bobby Sand Harbour, in, in what well, was see, first seen in Bobby Sand Harbour in 2004 when Dave Peake recorded it. Since then, we've seen it in several other locations and it's spread to Cornwall. Not something you'll see intertidally, but you can see why it's called a black-faced blenny. And this is a male in breeding colours um, and he's going to attract uh, females. So Bobby Sander Harbour is a good place for them. Uh, some of the places that they have occurred, they've disappeared from. Right, let's go to somewhere really interesting, um, the Eddystone Reefs. Uh, this is the gang that I usually go out with, the Plymouth Sound Diving Club. Um, and you can see the Eddystone Lighthouse in the background. We're actually on a reef which is just short of the Eddystone, about one kilometre short of the Eddystone, and which turned out to be an absolutely fabulous uh, diving site. But don't forget, I'm looking at stuff which lives on the reef, on the sediment seabed. Remote sampling, actually seeing what's in the sediment is very important. And it was the end of the 19th century that this area was being sampled um, by the then director of the marine laboratory uh, and some really interesting information came out of that essentially mapping the distribution of different seabed biotopes so don't think we've only just started doing it and there was other work in the 1930s using a peterson grab and um, ford um, did this really very, very clever, but very simple way of illustrating what lives in 0.1 of a square meter of the seabed. He got one of his best, probably his best samples from the grab and he laid it out. And you can see a heart urchin, you can see brittle stars, you can see lots of clams and so on. And a, and a Christie's crab. So that's that. And then of course you had toad video coming along, taking reels of up to 220 35 millimeter photographs of the seabed. The Eddystone reefs. I want you to look out for this. It's Alaria esculenta. It's a cold water species. It used to occur on the mainland coast. Now it only occurs on the Eddystone reef. But will it come back on the mainland coast? Look out for it. It's got this very distinctive midrib but don't confuse it with the non-native Wakami Undaria. So very good diving, lots of spectacular opportunities for photographs, 
These are all jewel anemones. Jewel anemones are a real rubbish species. They just grow everywhere. And, and sometimes you get fantastic visibility. Now, I think this was 15 meters visibility here, and you can really see the rock structure. You can't see the color because <clears throat> my flash just doesn't go that far. <clears throat> you can see though, this is a fairly strong torch, and you can see some of the jewel anemones colored up here. So that's the sort of visibility we dream of. And again, a bit later on in this dive, I put a bit of flash onto this. We're down at about uh, 25, 28 meters depth. Let's say 28 meters depth. And again, I hope your gardens look like this at the end of the summer. Absolutely fabulous and colorful. And masses of these pink sea fans. They're a protected species. Now that protection largely goes back to when divers used to collect them as, as souvenirs. I see their importance because they attract some species which are very specific to the pink sea fans. The sea fan sea slug, Tritonia, here it is, it's tiny, um, here's its egg mass. You know, the, the pink sea, the, the sea slug is smaller than your little fingernail, there's its egg mass. The sea fan anemone is very specific to the pink sea fans. Actually, by, it smothers the tissue of the sea fan and when it moves away it leaves dead sea fan. And little sn a snail which is endowed with uh, an interesting name it was one which I when I was asked to collect some Simnia patula uh, for some German taxonomists I said oh there's one which looks a bit different which lives on the sea fans and actually it turned out to be a new species which they kindly named after me so there's the highlight of your rock pooling career is to have a species named after you not impossible. I'm going to try and get to the end quite quickly now. Um, again, use acoustic surveys. This is work done by Plymouth um, University, Plymouth University, and this is the old submerged cliff line, two nautical miles south of the breakwater at Plymouth. And you can see all of these structures. And if you've got the right software, you can actually sort of say, well, I'd rather like to look in that gully. What's the latitude and longitude for it? Or, or I can match that particular place with a popular diving site, which, um, which we've got and which we use the GPS for. So, you know, you can actually use this sort of diagram and say, yeah, that, that's going to be interesting there. I want to go in there, drop me, you know, drop the shot right in there. So that is absolutely fabulous. Again, I'd love to get out there when the visibility is absolutely brilliant. I think the visibility was about 10 meters on this occasion, still not good enough uh, to get the idea of what a fantastic drop off it is. It is the old submerged cliff line from 14,000 years ago when the sea level was about four, 40 meters lower than it is today. So red sea fingers, uh, football sea squirts here, lots of uh, pink sea fans uh, and so on. Fabulous dive site really colorful uh, things like sunset cup coral as well uh, nationally rare species uh, only known from about seven locations in uh, britain uh, a, a warm water species very abundant in the mediterranean probably always been here um, things like the yellow cluster anemones uh, football sea square it's interesting because we but we, we come back you know divers would come back saying hey i saw three football sea squirts during that dive and then in 2008, we had a mass sort of settlement. They, they reproduced really successfully and they continued to. And so now I could take a photograph um, of a, a reef area about uh, five, six meters across, and it would have 10 football sea squirts in the photograph. So it's become an abundant species. There are episodic events. Um, and of course, one of the episodic events, which I've mentioned already, uh, the settlement of spiny lobsters, this is a tiny one, isn't it? I mean, that hole is no more than about two inches across. Um, and this is a baby spiny lobster, which is settled uh, out of the plankton, probably come across from Brittany. Uh, the larvae are in the plankton for about five months. So they've got plenty of time to spread. So, you know, we've seen a revival in the spiny lobster population since 2014. Right, we're going to come to an end soon because I'm going to take you into Plymouth Sound. And again, I'm going to use um, a multi-beam sonar image to say 
this blue area here is going to be about 40 meters depth. So the old river channel, just remember this, what you've got in Plymouth Sound, the navigation channel is the old river gorge. And it, and it is a gorge. Look how steep this is here, going from basically into tidal down to 40 meters um, off Mount Edgecombe uh, in a very short distance. And the same at Eastern King Point, a very popular dive site um, uh, and fabulous marine life as well. So that's a, a typical sort of uh, rear community uh, at the entrance to the Tamar at Devil's Point. Uh, here we are off the waterfront restaurant, um, masses of sea squirts, dystemus, uh, filigree worms, which you don't see on the open coast, I think it gets smashed up by wave action. So filigree worms, uh, very delicate, uh, white uh, sea fingers, um, gelatinous uh, rhizomes, uh, sponges, and then where the tide hits the cliff and accelerates over the edge of the cliff at the top, that's where you get the fish hanging out. They're just hanging there waiting for plankton to be brought to them by the tide. So these are the sorts of species you get at the entrance of the Tamar. Uh, jewel anemones, as I say, a bit of a rubbish species. Um, open pipe hydroids, which are there briefly during the spring because they very quickly get discovered by the sea slugs and they get eaten. And a few weeks after you've had this bloom, you'll find that the sea slugs have eaten them and laid their eggs on the empty uh, stalks. Other stars, here's a fan mussel. I told you to look out for fan mussels in the intertidal. We had nine um, at West Ho off the waterfront restaurant one year, but I haven't found any there for several years now. And red bandfish, spectacular. Um, look, these live in vertical burrows about 50 centimetres deep. I'm only about 50 centimetres away from this one. I've got a very wide angle lens, so it's a bit nervous, but its friends in the background are all out of their burrows, feeding on passing plankton, snapping at passing plankton. So they come in and out of their burrows at only two metres below extreme low water level. And amazingly, after the 20, 13, 14 storms, they were still there. So they survived those awful conditions. So that's really the end of my tour around um, South Devon underwater. Uh, I went a bit longer than I hoped, but there we are. I'm just going to say that you can find out what's where. You can use this particular uh, website. Uh, it will, if you interrogate one of those triangles, it will tell you what the particular biotopes are. Um, you can then go and see who did the survey work and you used to be able to get a species list. You can't now, which is a major, major, major complaint to mine. They basically took lowest common denominator. In Europe, a lot of countries couldn't provide that sort of detailed information. And so they said, all right, well, we'll all do the same thing and we'll cancel that particular part of the uh, website. So that's absolutely ridiculous, absolutely stupid. And I've told them so, but... Um, I don't get taken any notice of. So anyway, um, they do need to reintroduce that uh, species list by interrogating each one of these triangles. So I've been diving now for more than 50 years, taking photographs for more than 50 years. Um, where to now for me? Some people think I should disappear off the scene and just quietly uh, retire and sit in front of the television with my slippers on. Well, of course, I brought everything together in uh, Britain's hidden world, not everything, but this explores seabed habitats all around Great Britain. I've been very fortunate in being involved in surveys oh, no for 40 years. And uh, I think Toby's got that one. I think it, she... And also, somebody's got their mic turned on. Um, I need to archive my images. So uh, I think Mike kindly mentioned about my images. Um, well, I am working to, I mean, the MBA has an external hard drive which has all of my images on it should they need it for um, publicity purposes or whatever. But I do need to tidy them and I'm gradually working through that. It was something I thought, oh, I'll do that during lockdown. No, it's taking much longer than that. 
So uh, eventually um, my images will be archived at the Marine Biological Association and they'll be available for the MBA to use as they see fit. So they're not going to disappear in a skip somewhere. So that's me. That's what I'm up to. Um, this makes a fabulous Christmas present, by the way. Don't forget that. Uh, and thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Keith, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, I was absolutely mesmerising, to be honest. Um, I forgot to mention to everybody at the beginning uh, that we will have time at the end of Keith's talk for some uh, Q&A. Um, during Keith's talk, um, a couple of people were um, using the chat option to um, text in some questions. So is that okay with you, Keith? Can I just throw a couple of questions? Yeah, I'm just looking down. Um, I'm reading them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just looking down myself, but you've, po you've chosen some, have you, Mike? Uh, well, I think I think uh, the obvious one, I suppose, is... Mike, uh, just before that, if you remember, we, we agreed, I was yeah, just sorry. saying a word. Just say a word about the website, yeah. uh, the group, Shores of South Devon. I know some of you are members of it. We're trying to build up our numbers as much as we can because that will ensure that we are still sort of functioning uh, entity by the end of the lockdown. So uh, I'm going to send out uh, a little letter to you later on, or email, which will give you the link. But if you go on our website, uh, you can uh, find out that's www.shoresofsouthdevon.org.uk. You can find out um, how to join. Uh, the link doesn't.